All right, so back to topic 11, we were kind of like almost all the way done. Okay, so we were talking about disease transmission, we were talking about Lyme disease, West Nile virus, and, and um, a whole bunch of other things. And I kind of finished off on this idea of um, uh, emerging infectious diseases or re-emerging infectious diseases. And these are things that public health and uh, disease specialists are always trying to watch out for, right? Because um, we don't want these things to come, right? Ooh, so some of these things, um, there's all sorts of factors and, and reasons why diseases may appear and, uh, and lead to outbreaks. So I mentioned like populations and humans are doing all sorts of weird things. Um, so something we had mentioned already is uh, um, evolution of new viral strains, right? So we talked about influenza, for example, and um, how influenza, if you remember going back away in topic six, we had that genetic drift. So that's kind of just every year the virus kind of mutates and, and uh, you know, just enough so that every year we have new flu viruses in circulation. But they're usually not that different from previous years, but different enough that the old vaccine is probably not quite as effective. So we have a new flu shot every year. Um, but once in a while, we get genetic shift, which is where you have this rare circumstance where um, multiple viruses infect one cell. And this usually happens in pig um, because pigs have uh, receptors that can actually uh, uh, get infected by bird viruses and get infected by human viruses. So this is actually what happened in 2009. And uh, from the genetic analysis, it was actually a uh, quadruple infection. So it might have been two cells getting infected twice and then another one getting, you know, or it could have happened all at once. We don't really know. Uh, and this probably happened at least a couple of years before 09, so maybe 07 or something like that. So this is kind of what it looks like, right? You've got a swine flu virus, you've got an avian flu virus, and a human flu virus. And this is information again. And like I said, you get the reassortment in the, uh, in the pig, and you get a new strain, and then that new strain is able to infect other pigs, but also humans, because like I said, humans and pigs have the same receptor. And so um, this is what happened way back in the Spanish flu in 1918. And that was a worst case scenario where uh, it was killing millions of people like crazy. Uh, the 09 was a weird virus. Um, young people were getting really sick with the flu. Usually it's old people get really sick with the flu. Young people, you might be in bed for a day or two, but it's like not as much of a big deal. And it's the old people that are having uh, complications. And, and whereas the 09 virus, it was kind of the opposite. There were young people getting really violently ill and the older people actually had some immunity. So this is kind of a new thing. So this is why we are always watching flu viruses because we're very concerned about these things because we're, we're thinking back, you know, 1918 Spanish flu, uh, we don't want that to happen. So what about avian flu? This is something that hits the news uh, at least a couple of times a year if you pay attention to infectious disease news. Um, there's always an outbreak somewhere, it seems. Um, and, uh, you know, they talk about the bird flu or avian flu. Avian means bird, right? Well, so what about this one, right? So um, this is where you have a strain that is infecting birds. And it turns out that the influenza virus actually does not usually infect the respiratory tract of birds. It actually is a gastrointestinal virus. You can imagine anywhere where there's birds and there's bird poop, <laughs> um, there's a risk. And there's a whole bunch of these viruses out there. So human virus, human flu viruses are usually H1, H2, or H3, right? So that H, the hemagglutinin, is, is the, uh, um, the thing on the virus that binds a receptor in a human cell. Um, and then the other ones, I think it goes up to nine, uh, don't usually bind human cells very tightly. The five is sort of an exception where it sort of might sometimes bind human cells. And, uh, and the seven as well. And so there's a bunch of these flu viruses out there. You can see there's a few there that people are monitoring because they do sometimes cause human disease. So how does that happen? Well, as I mentioned, um, bird feces, okay? So uh, we're talking about uh, sometimes you have farmers, uh, sometimes people that are dealing with uh, waterfowl and things like that. You can see here's this guy here and he's handling a chicken and he's touching his, uh, his face and you know, getting up the nose or whatever, and uh, and then you know, I mean, it's it's not hard to imagine, right? 
And so it gets into the lungs and causes a respiratory infection. So usually you're looking at a bird to human transmission. I think there's been one or two documented human to human transmission cases, but that is super rare. So it's usually people dealing with just the birds. Um, but that's the risk, right? What if this virus does do a recombination event in a pig and then becomes a highly pathogenic thing? Because a lot of these are really highly pathogenic. I'll show you some numbers in a minute. Thought I had another um, another image here. You can see birds, like you know, I don't know if anyone here has ever owned chickens or not, um, but I've seen them, and they're 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 pretty filthy animals. Um, and uh, you can see all these all these events leading leading to um, uh, uh, leading to what's going on there. Um, there's a lot of places in the world where there are live food markets, right? Um, you know, many parts of Asia and Africa, South America, you, you know, you want, you want chicken for dinner, you go to the live market and, and they have them there in cages and you pick one out and, and it's still alive when you pick it out. And sometimes they bring it in the back and chop the head off and then give it to you, right? Um, so these, these vendors who have the chickens, this is a pretty common thing to do. Sometimes the chickens start choking on something. So what do you do? Chicken CPR, right? Um, not giving them heart uh, heart pumps, but more of the rescue breathing. Literally, this this is a thing people do. They they grab the chicken and sort of suck at its beak, and, and it helps the chicken to get the thing out of the throat and saves the chicken. And now you can still sell that thing. So that's a high risk activity, it turns out, um, and um, and probably leads to a lot of these infections. Yeah. So is it not from eating the meat? Not from eating the meat. No, it's more ex exposure to the feces, and. Um, uh, I'll show you some some cases in a second. These these are, are most common in various parts of Asia. These these uh, uh, these diseases. There's there's a map. Uh, this is tracking H5N1. A um, little bit of a older map. I couldn't find a newer version of this map. I probably could could if I did a little bit more digging. Um, but you can see, and, and you know, basically anywhere worldwide, right? Birds fly, huh. and um, and some of them migrate across the oceans and all that. But this is this particular strain H5N1 is one that uh, people are very concerned about. Um, only a few hundred cases uh, you know, measured over, over a, a 10 year span with 60% mortality, right? This is, this is very serious. Um, probably there are many more cases, right? There are people get sick and they don't go to the hospital all the time. Uh, but let's say we chop that more about mortality down by to 6%, that's still a very, very serious disease. Um, so like I said, lots of people are tracking these kind of things. You hear about it in the news because this kind of thing happens at least every couple of years somewhere, usually in Asia. So uh, there's been, this has happened in Korea, uh, Hong Kong, uh, various parts of China, uh, Vietnam, and uh, they have an outbreak. And what do they do? They kill all the chickens. I'm talking about millions of chickens. You know, there's an outbreak in this, this province and they're like, okay, all you farmers, that's it. And you can see they're dumping eggs and they're going through with the, the biohazard suits and they're, yeah, yeah, uh, farmers don't like this obviously, uh, but that's what, they're, that's what they do when the outbreak happens because they just assume the entire flock and of course you've got these massive farming operations with thousands of birds. And of course uh, you can have um, wild birds interacting with the, with the uh, tame birds that can bring it to neighboring farms. So we're talking about, like I said, entire problems this will happen all the time. We're very concerned about. We don't want it to um, to do that recombination event and uh, and become some sort of highly pathogenic human to human transmission kind of thing. And that's what was the concern with H1N1 in 2009. Is this highly pathogenic? And it turns out it wasn't as bad, not even anywhere near as bad as it could have been. Uh, other diseases, uh, you know, humans are interacting with wildlife all over the world all the time. And now we have this coronavirus thing going on. And so I showed you this slide before uh, in that um, up until the year 2000, there were four known coronaviruses all causing mild cold-like symptoms. And uh, they came from different rodents, bats, and, and rats. And usually there's some sort of intermediate kind of host um, that uh, humans are a little bit more intimate with. Uh, you know, we're not usually having rats or bats as pets necessarily. Uh, I'm sure some people do. But, uh, you know, and then we're looking at uh, the 2000s and we had the SARS-1, SARS Classic, which was very scary. Uh, this was a huge, huge deal uh, and, and very high mortality. And then we had MERS emerge in 2012, which seemed to go through camels, also 
very highly pathogenic. And now here we are at uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is um, very infectious. And um, depending on where you are, uh, you know, not as pathogenic and not killing as many people as this, but still, you know, the we've all felt the consequences of this, right? Whether it's been uh, people getting sick or, or, or economic. You know, they're talking about, uh, they're just talking in the news recently how uh, in the United States, um, 100,000 children have been orphaned due to COVID-19 in the United States. I just, my mind is blown, right? Like, I mean, that's that's a very significant impact. And I don't know whether they meant orphan, meaning one or both parents. I, I, it wasn't clear from it, but uh, it's still a very large number, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, like I said, lots of lots of interaction with wildlife can lead to, you know, these things popping up. Uh, what other situations, right? Uh, overuse, misuse of drugs. Uh, I could give you a whole lecture on this and all the antibiotics they use in agriculture that are totally misused. Um, but not going to go into all that. We already talked a little bit about antibiotics and superbugs. And uh, the number one superbug, of course, is MRSA, which stands for methicillin resistant or multi drug resistant. So I think I was telling you that all the classic literature calls it methicillin resistant. All the newer stuff is shifting to multi drug resistant because that's a more accurate definition of what this organism is uh, Staphylococcus aureus. And uh, so there it is. And uh, um, normally we're talking about skin infections, but if it gets into other body systems can be very serious, right? If it gets into the blood or urinary tracts and now people have antibiotics and the antibiotics don't work, uh, you can lead to chronic issues. Um, I actually had a friend who had, um, actually it was just a skin infection of, of, of uh, MRSA on her face. So she had this awful rash on her face. And I don't know how many different courses of antibiotics she went through, but literally she had a big rash on her face for months. Uh, so that wasn't necessarily like threatening to her, but of course, you know, having something like that in your face is, uh, you know, does a, uh, doesn't do a lot uh, to make you feel happy about yourself, right? Uh, so what do we do with these things, right? You know, this is why hospitals, you know, we have, um, you know, masking and gowning and isolation of patients and all those kind of things. Uh, that we're trying to deal with uh, with with this. Uh, the number two superbug. Well, it seems to be number two in a lot of lists now. We're going to talk about uh, C. diff uh, a little bit in the next lecture uh, as well. Is um, um, something that can be spread very easily in hospitals as well because of uh, endospores. This is one that I don't really full, know the full story. But 20 years ago, most people like that hadn't heard of it. It wasn't an issue. Now it's like hitting the hospitals like crazy. So I'm not sure what has changed uh, for this kind of thing. I had um, uh, another friend um, who um, was telling me uh, he, he was quite ill and they gave him uh, a drug called clindamycin, which is a very strong um, a broad spectrum antibiotic. And um, so I was asking him a little bit about it and he was willing to divulge um, what had happened to him. Um, so he had had the clindamycin from another infection and then he had um, severe uh, C. diff diarrhea. And uh, I think I mentioned before, apparently you know it because it smells really bad, like, like rotten egg smell. Um, and uh, so this is called antibiotic induced diarrhea. And this is a pretty common kind of thing that happens, right? People take a strong broad spectrum antibiotic, uh, the normal bacteria complementing your system is wiped out or at least uh, 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 reduced dramatically. Uh, C. diff, not a problem because, hey, it's got endospores that aren't getting killed by the drug, and then it gives a chance to get a, a foothold and, and, um, and, cause, uh, and cause the diarrhea. And we'll talk about how it causes that. This goes by a lot of names, by the way. Um, everyone I know calls it C. diff. Full name is Clostridium difficile. It also has another binomial name. Clostroides difficile. So I don't know whether that's a Canadian American thing or UK Canadian thing. I don't know why, why both of them come up. You can see if you call it C. diff, that kind of covers both names. Sometimes you see it abbreviated as CDI. So if you see any of those, it's C. diff. Okay, one other thing. Um, changing patterns. You know, we're talking about climate change and things like that. There's definitely, uh, you look at the spread of Lyme disease over the past 40 years. It arrived in Canada in 1982. Right, uh, and it was just found in one location, and now it's slowly spreading. It's in, been in Manitoba for about ten years now, uh, and uh, and places that didn't have it are slowly getting it. 
uh, and that's something that we're, we're watching. Modern transportation, right? Um, West Nile virus showed up in 1999 in New York City. It was in Canada by the year 2000, across Canada by 2002, right? So how did it show up in New York City? Because this was something that came from uh, uh, Europe, Asia, Africa. Um, we believe it came on an airplane. So maybe an infected mosquito, uh, we're not entirely sure, um, but uh, it, we're, we're pretty sure that that's how it, how it got there because it literally was traced back to the airport in terms of the first case. So that kind of thing. Anyone know what this is? This is a, a map of the globe, and this is showing um, flight patterns, right? So, I mean, this is the thing, right? You know, diseases, they, you know, people travel all over the place nowadays. Even when there's a global pandemic locking down places, diseases still have a chance to travel over the place. This has uh, been, um, this popped up on the internet when the pandemic started, right? People were talking about other potential pandemics and all that. This map's been around for a long time um, of terrifying and possible outbreaks that can happen. Uh, and you can see this is just kind of, uh, I don't even know who put it together, uh, listing various outbreaks that have spread, um, you know, just due to human humans moving around. Uh, so this is kind of kind of a big deal, right? So kind of the last thing to finish on off the topic is, um, you know, all this epidemiology and those kind of things require uh, uh, record records and uh, other things. Oh, sorry, ahead of myself. <laughs> this is about humanization. Uh, so this is something that, that you know we're kind of in the um, in the process now of, of dealing with, right? You know, people are talking about vaccine passports and things like that, and and uh, as if it's something new, it's not. Uh, it turns out vaccine passports have been around for like a hundred years. We had them with smallpox, we had them with polio, we still have them today with yellow fever. You can see that first one, yellow fever. Um, some of you may know this already if you've ever traveled to certain countries. You get off the airplane, they want to see your passport, they want to see your yellow fever vaccination record, right? And, uh, and that's, just kind of a, that's just kind of a thing. Um, some of these are more recommended, but yellow fever is required for going to certain countries. Uh, rabies, uh, I always laugh when I look at this one, you know, nobody normally gets the rabies shot, uh, you know, unless you have reason to believe you've been exposed. But this one's recommending it if you think you're going to have direct contact with wild carnivores. I don't know how many people fit that situation. <laughs> um, one or two people out there, I'm sure, but uh, most people are not in that category. Uh, typhoid fever, again, you know, something um, that's based on on where you might travel. If you travel to uh, a developing country, you know, hepatitis A is a pretty common uh, travel vaccine as well. So, okay, there, back to where I was ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that we got to keep records on everything, and there are many. Um, agencies that keep track of records of all sorts of diseases. Uh, in Alberta, that would be Alberta Health Services, and they report to um, health, Public Health uh, Canada, um, and, uh, and, and often a lot of those numbers are sent to the World Health Organization. The United States, uh, there's also the CDC, Center for Disease Control, and they keep track of diseases worldwide as well, and uh, have a really good database of these kinds of things. So a lot of these diseases that we do get are considered notifiable. So that means by law, if there is a case that's been um, detected by a clinic or a healthcare practitioner, there's a, there's a system for re recording it. This does not include all diseases. If people have the common cold, um, that's not a reportable disease. So we don't have necessarily good statistics on everything. But some diseases we do. Here's some uh, diseases that are notifiable in Alberta. And uh, you can see they fall under different categories, so like bioterrorism agents. Huh. We certainly want to know if that happens. Uh, some um, are, you know, routine vaccination kind of uh, diseases, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, water, foodborne. And you can see a lot of these are connected with um, um, kind of prevention, right? Uh, you know, if we have some sort of outbreak in our um, in our romaine lettuce, we want to know about it and, 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 you know, tell the grocery stores to pull it off the shelves and those kind of things. I'll show you some numbers. Um, here's some numbers for some of the diseases on that list. You can see diseases preventable by routine vaccination. And um, this is uh, 2019 numbers, the most recent ones I could find. So you can see in Canada, chickenpox, uh, 450 cases. In Alberta, there were four. Pertussis, that's whooping cough, um, 344 measles, there were four. 
so these 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 cases, you know, they they go up and down from year to year, but it's good to uh, you know monitor them, right? Uh, sexually transmitted diseases, enteric and food and waterborne diseases. So you can see that these are um, these are important. And of course, right now we're tracking all the COVID nineteen cases uh, as, as well, right? Which is a reportable disease. Okay, some last thoughts on disease transmission. Okay, but first, how much you touch your face. Remember, um, I used to work with a guy and he literally read some magazine article about touching your face and how it makes you sick. And then all day he was screaming at himself because he's like, he had no idea how often he does this, right? But this is this is apparently it, right? Average person brings their fingers to their nose and mouth and whatever, uh, 16 times an hour, uh, children even more. Um, you know, this is why hand washing is, is an important thing, right? Uh, so something else, respiratory viruses, they can survive um, uh, in some cases a few days, uh, particularly when they have uh, mucus involved with them. Uh, it keeps them moist and, and, and preserved, uh, again, some of them a lot less. Um, but, you know, think of all the thing, potential things that mucus could be on, right? Money, whatever, doorknobs. Uh, number three, okay, handshakes, right? That can transfer a lot more bacteria. So, you know, if you, um, if you have, you see me in the hallway and uh, you know you don't want to risk a handshake you may fist bump if you want uh hand sanitizers soap right um hand washing was a thing before the pandemic right uh and and so you know it's it's always a good you know practice to encourage children and and, and everybody to uh, you know wash their hands at appropriate moments right um, so anyway some last last thoughts on on these things so that is it for that topic. Um, topic 12, we're gonna move to right now. I'll just load it up. Any questions about that one? I think most of that's pretty straightforward. Okay. So I think I'm officially 40 minutes behind this semester so far. See if we can make up the time by the end. Um, topic 12 is kind of a combination of things. It's one of these units that every every year I'm like, should I make it two topics or one topic? We're going to talk about microbiomes, which is kind of you know the the, um, the bacteria that live in and on us, and we're going to talk about infections and disease, which they are kind of intertwined in a sense, because there's, uh, I think I mentioned this before earlier in the semester, there's kind of that question is why is it that, you know, some of these organisms make us sick and then sometimes they don't, right? Um, so this is kind of what the question we want to answer in this, in this uh, unit about pathogenicity and virulence, infection versus disease, you know, all sorts of things like that. So we're going to start off talking about microbiomes. And uh, so if you think about your body, um, your body is actually a full ecosystem. Here's some numbers for you, right? Uh, depending on the size of, of you, you know, there's different sizes of humans. You're looking at around maybe 30 trillion cells, right? Uh, again, you know, we're all different sizes. Some people are lighter and some people are heavier than maybe five kilograms. Um, that was just an average I had pulled off the internet. Uh, we're looking at maybe 20,000 genes. Um, you look at your bacteria, just your bacteria alone, at least as many cells. And if you look at the variety of species, we're looking at millions of genes. Um, so, you know, like you seem human, but you, in some ways you're more bacterial than human, right? So, you know, so people are talking about this a lot in terms of what is all going on here. This is an incomplete ecosystem. You've got exchange of materials. You've got interactions, very, very complex. And so we want to kind of talk about some of these interactions today. Um, and uh, it's very fascinating. This is a very um, um, kind of really cool area of research that is, that is uh, again, a lot of information the last few years. And I'll kind of touch on some of that here today. Um, so some definitions. Uh, I'm probably going to use all three of these words sort of interchangeably. And they mean slightly different things, right? These definitions, you can Google them and they're, they're like 95% the same, but they're not entirely the same, but I'll, most people use them interchangeably. So microflora is kind of the old term. Flora, I don't know if anyone knows what flora means. It usually means flowers, right? Microflora, 
a long time ago, people used to think bacteria were plants because they had a cell wall. So microflora means, you know, the teeny tiny plants that live on your body. Some people hate that term because they're like, they're not plants. People like me love that term because that was the term I learned. So I use it all the time. When I say flora, I mean the bacteria that lives on your body. Uh, so a lot of people said, let's use this term here, microbiota, which I don't know, it doesn't roll off the tongue as easily. And now everyone's talking about microbiomes. So what is the difference here? Microbiomes means the organisms and their genes and their metabolites. And so all the stuff that, that is them um, that are living in a certain place, right? So that could mean your body. We could talk about the microbiome of the body. We could talk about a body system. We could talk about the microbiome of your mouth. Or we could talk about the microbiome of, I don't know, a swamp or the ocean or whatever, right? These are the microorganisms that live there. Um, and often people are mostly talking about bacteria, but let's not forget about all the other things that live there. They are all included. Um, there are probably 300 trillion viruses, right? All of these bacteria have viruses infect them. Never mind, there are viruses infect fungi and archaea and, and protists and so on. And yeah, you read that right. There are animals that live on the human body. We'll get to that in a minute. So anyway, we're talking about this stuff a lot. And uh, it turns out that they're really important for health. And um, it, we're at the point now where a lot of people are starting to talk about the microbiome as the, the latest organ or organ system. And uh, there's a lot of things that we have these connections. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of studies in terms of things like there's connections to Parkinson's disease, mental health, um, obesity, uh, I mean, you name it, there's been people who have found links between the microbiome and all, all of these things. Uh, very, very interesting. So let's talk about what some of those things are that they're doing. Uh, I'd mentioned some of the good things that microbes are doing to your health, like they're helping you with digestion. Um, some of them are making vitamins, uh, vitamin K, vitamin uh, B12, which I think is niacin. Um, they, uh, they can actually uh, release nutrients from certain types of foods. So, like we can't digest cellulose. And so some bacteria will actually break down cellulose a little bit and release some of those nutrients into our system. Uh, and we're learning that actually these microbes have a huge part in the development of our immune system when we're babies. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so if you don't have them, you're, you're not gonna have a very good immune system. So these are things that are very, very important. Uh, there are, uh, Microbes in your gut making neurotransmitters. Microbes in your, in your intestine make more serotonin than your body does. So like, are these things, you know, serotonin, what, what is that one? It's supposed to make you happy or something like that? Or content? So are these microbes messing with our minds? Probably, right? Um, we have a lot of questions about this. Some of them are doing bad stuff. Um, some of them can become pathogens, right? If you end up with... Uh, you know, a good microbe, but it's in the wrong body system. So E. coli, for example, migrates from the intestine and becomes a blood infection. Uh, that's obviously very bad. Uh, some of them are um, stealing nutrients, right? Um, and causing other kind of health effects. Uh, some of them lead to things like inflammation or their, or their byproducts can lead to uh, various types of, uh, you know, we think that's what's going on with Lyme disease. Is the bacteria long and dead? But, uh, but there's molecules still lingering in the system causing different types of arthritis and things like that. So there's, there's lots of bad things that can happen. And tons of studies, I keep seeing these studies, half of these I haven't read them yet, because um, there's just too many, right? Linking them with um, cancer treatments, autoimmune disorders, mental health, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. You know, all these things, a lot of these things are, um, are human conditions that our understanding of is really not anywhere near complete, right? Um, if you've ever known someone with chronic fatigue syndrome, every single one of those people have had frustration with the healthcare system because honestly, we don't know what to do with them. How do you treat that? There could be several different causes. It could be psychological, it could be Lyme disease. It could be, I mean, there's so many different things and many of those things are very difficult to treat in the long term. And, uh, and, and there's, there's so much we don't understand about it. Uh, same thing with, uh, with a lot of autoimmune immune disorders. You know, why does one person get triggered and have this condition? And yet, you know, everyone else in their household is fine and they presumably sharing some of the same genetics and those kind of things, right? Um, so lots of questions about these and the microbiome apparently is linked to all of them. 
uh, like I said, there's lots of research to be done, lots to be learned in the future. Really fascinating place um, to, uh, 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 to to read about. So let's talk about these things, these microbiome. Um, we have uh, uh, all sorts of organisms that live with us. Some of them are resident flora. So by resident flora, I mean, they are with us, they're with us for good, and that's part of what it means to be human. So a classic example of this is Staphylococcus epidermidis. Every single human has it on his or her skin. We all have it on our skin. It's just once you're born, it gets on there, it colonizes, that's the place for it to be. Transient means organisms that can kind of come and go, right? So sometimes, you know, I could touch that doorknob. Um, somebody uh, maybe before me, uh, let's say they, um, I don't know, uh, were digging around in the dirt and they got some soil bacteria on there, on there and I get it on my hands but, and then I wash my hands. So transient can mean it's there for minutes, hours, weeks, months, but eventually they kind of come and go. So classic example of that is Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus is on us about a quarter, a third of the time. Uh, usually is there for, you know, days or weeks. Um, it comes and goes. So if you look at us, you know, in this classroom, if there's 30 of us, about, you know, 10 of us have it on our skin right now, and it's not really a big deal. And it comes and goes. Uh, there's many factors that affect the microbiome. Um, some of them are pretty obvious, things like hygiene, right? Do you wash your hands? Do you shower a lot? Do you not shower? Do you use soap in your shower? What kind of soap do you use? Right, you know, I know there's, you know, I mean, the huge movement last few years for people to not use shampoo, um, and um, you know that's going to affect your scalp microbiome, right? If you're not using shampoo on your scalp all the time, um, that's going to affect the complement of, of organisms that are in there for good or bad, right? Um, things like, uh, you know, if an infant is breastfeeding versus using formula, that's going to affect their gut microbiome. Uh, antibiotic use, hopefully that's an obvious one that's also going to affect, uh, you know, what is in and on your body. Uh, and we'll probably mention a few more examples uh, over this lecture. So how do we study how we get the microbes right from the very beginning? Um, we can use what are called notobiotic animals. Usually it's mice. You can see uh, there's some little mice there. And uh, what they do is they, they grow them in a sterile uh, environment. And uh, usually the mice are actually produced by, uh, by cleaning the mother and, uh, and feeding her uh, high doses of antibiotics. And then they remove the babies by C-section and put them in a new sterile chamber. And they're growing and they're being fed sterile food and all these kind of things. So this has become a really popular technique the last few years to try to understand uh, not only acquisition of our microbes, how we get them, but as I mentioned, this, this huge connection between the bacteria and our immune development. And so these mice, their immune systems are terrible. If you look at their, uh, their gut health and all sorts of things, um, they, they don't, they're not doing very well. So it turns out their organisms, like I said, they're essential for your immune development and the maintenance of your immune system as we go along. These are organisms that are living in symbiosis with us and uh, without them, we're in trouble. So it's not always about getting rid of the, the organisms. Uh, here's uh, just a picture talking about, you know, the baby getting its microbes. Basically, um, a fetus is, not everyone considers it sterile, but it's pretty much sterile. As soon as the water breaks, you have an introduction of microorganisms um, into the uh, placental sac. And uh, as the baby is born, uh, it's gonna be exposed to microorganisms through the birth canal. Um, as it touches people, you know, they take the baby out and, and, and hug it. Uh, it's going to breastfeed and, or, or, take, or take microbes from um, on the surface of a bottle. All of those things are going to uh, expose the child to microorganisms. And the colonization, depending on the organism, can take uh, days to weeks to months. So E. coli, uh, for example, it's anywhere from a month to six months before a baby is fully colonized with E. coli in the colon. And, uh, it, you know, and, and this, is, this is part of the development. And um, it's, not, it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. And, uh, you know, the question is, you know, and there's even people questioning whether there's ways we can stimulate this with the good microbes better than the bad microbes. And I'll, I'll, I'll just mention that in a moment. I just want to see if there's anything else on here. Uh, one of the big things that we've learned is that uh, the microbial complement between babies that have a vaginal birth versus a C-section is actually different, at least initially. 
And this actually leads to uh, um, sometimes different health outcome outcomes, which I think I have here. Um, so you can see right there, uh, children born by C-section, um, they have higher risks of a few things. It doesn't mean you're going to get type 1 diabetes or asthma if you've had a C-section. It just means that statistically, the chances are a little bit higher. And so we believe this has something to do with the colonization by the bacteria. Uh, there's a lot of interesting recent studies about this. There's something that came out a few years ago, um, people talking about uh, uh, um, doing vaginal seeding to their babies. I don't think anyone's heard of this. This is the idea that the baby is born by C-section and, um, and the mother would take a, a cloth or something and, uh, and take organisms from her vaginal area and spread them around the face of the child. Right, and in order, the idea is to seed the baby with the good bacteria. And um, so at the moment, um, there's actually been a couple of studies done on this. For years, there, there are actually women doing this for quite some time, ever since these studies about asthma started to come out. Um, and, and only recently did they actually do a couple of studies on this, and they didn't found and find any difference, other than they're actually recommending that women don't do it because there is some risk of other infections. Um, but, you know, maybe someday we'll, we'll figure something out. There'll be a spray or something with just the good bacteria or, or a, a technique. Um, I mean, who knows, right? This is the kind of thing that, like I said, I think is really, really fascinating. And, and what are these connections, right? You know, again, you're looking at these things, type one diabetes, allergies, asthma, these are immune system connections, right? So just showing that development of the immune system, you know, there's so much we don't understand, uh, so much to learn. So this is just a slide showing that, you know, your diversity of microorganisms changes over time. Uh, if you look at, you know, uh, young people, you can see they're getting colonized. Um, usually, uh, you know, there's a point where um, the system is really robust and healthy looking. Sometimes older people have a hard time having good intestinal health, which is why, you know, they, they want to eat fiber and things like that. And uh, anyway, lots of, uh, lots of interesting studies on this. Too. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about where um, these things live and some of the common inhabitants. Um, this is not a comprehensive, fully thorough list. Mostly I'm kind of pointing out some of the organisms that we've already talked about and some of the ones that are essential, that are important for human health. Uh, you can see this is showing uh, different types of organisms in these pie ch charts and, uh, and the different locations where they live. So most of the organisms um, that live in or on our body, the majority of them we're talking about the intestine. Uh, but there are other places. There's your skin, there's your mouth, uh, there is uh, the vagina, um, some in the stomach, uh, and, and other various places, right? So I want to talk a little bit about some of these organisms. Start at the outside, the skin, and uh, you can see here's some common microflora. So again, the ones in bold are the ones that we're kind of featuring in this class, but uh, it's not, like I said, not a comprehensive, complete list. These are just some of the ones. The staphylococcus are pretty common on the skin. I mentioned before that staphylococcus is pretty tolerant to salty conditions. And so of course the skin can get salty from sweat. And so staphylococcus is really well suited to living on the skin. Uh, candida, uh, that is yeast, uh, is also reasonably suited to living on the skin. Uh, it's actually found, uh, and you're gonna see if we can look at these lists, there are some organisms, they just sort of come up on every list. And that just means that they're really good and really adaptable to living in multiple um, physiological locations. So let's talk a little bit about Staphylococcus. We keep coming back to Staphylococcus. We're gonna, you know, and we're gonna keep coming back to Staphylococcus. It's so important. Uh, the big one, like I said, that's found in all of us is Staphylococcus epidermidis. Uh, sometimes causes um, uh, uh, opportunistic infections, not usually harmful. Uh, just sometimes uh, it can get into, uh, you know, if it gets under subdermally, uh, it can cause uh, infections. Usually the one that we're more concerned about is Staphylococcus aureus. It has a lot more toxins and, and things like that that can cause more severe disease. And it's body system if it gets opportunity, if it can get there. Uh, so it's, it's very scary in a lot of ways. So notice I have a blank. There is one more Staphylococcus. I won't ask you about this one in the exam, but uh, just kind of an interesting one, Staphylococcus hominis. So that means human. And what is this one responsible for? Unfortunately, body odor. So um, this is one of these ones that, uh, you know, some people are really good at cultivating it, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, you know, so hygiene, right, and that kind of thing. So 
but mentioned there are animals that live on the human body. And there are different types of mites. I know this is horrifying, right? Everyone's gonna go home and try to wash their face and eyeballs now. Um, this is eyelash mites. I remember learning about these years ago and I just couldn't stop blinking for about like two days thinking, oh, are they on me? Probably, <laughs> um, probably they're there. This is about maybe 50% of people have these eyelash mites. They live kind of down here. Um, you can sort of see them, I'll zoom in there. And these little green things are the mites. They live in the follicles on the eyelashes. And there's a, there's a closer look at these things, right? And uh, so this is the kind of thing they, they feed off the oils in, in your skin. And um, apparently, like as you age, you're more likely to become infected. So I guess it's just a matter of time, right? If you don't have them now, you're going to get them eventually. Um, usually, they're not causing any troubles. I think there are rare cases where they cause the infection of a follicle, but my understanding is that's pretty rare. They're not causing us any harm. Uh, there are other kind of body mites that, that people have. Uh, you can look them up. Um, I'd rather not. <laughs> um, you know, but anyway, just something to throw out there because they're not all bacteria that are infecting us. Uh, upper respiratory tract. So we're talking about uh, you know the mouth, mouth um, ears, throat, you know, those kind of things. Uh, and uh, uh, trochlea and all those kind of things. Again, you got uh, Staphylococcus, 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 on <laughs> almost every list. Uh, a few others out there. Neisseria, remember we talked about Neisseria meningitidis. It's often found in saliva, and uh, some of us here today would have it on us as a transient part of our microflora and not causing us any harm, uh, although it might cause harm if it gets into your uh, spinal fluid or brain, right? And that happens sometimes. Uh, we do have a vaccine, and uh, many, many of you probably had it as, as children. I know I didn't. I'm too old for that. Um, I suppose I could ask for it if I wanted to get it. So lots of microflora there, and uh, uh, some that, like I said, I'm not going to get into all of these. So potential pathogens, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, right? Streptococcus uh, hygienes can cause strep throat. Um, so pretty common kind of uh, infection that people get. And candida, and I think I have a slide on candida. There's candida, of course. Um, this is a yeast, not a bacteria. And uh, in the uh, the mouth area, it can cause a uh, thrush. So the official name is, is candidiasis, right? Candid candidiasis. Some reason I always like to get a syllable on that one. Uh, and so you're looking at a growth um, tongue, and I found this little cartoon that shows you know it's all over the tonsils and the back of the throat as well. So I think I, we talked about this a little bit before. Um, anyone know who the typical people who are that might get this? The babies, yeah. And there's actually a whole bunch of other scenarios where people might get this. People with uh, immune issues, so HIV, AIDS. Um, sometimes I, I was reading that uh, it is call, more common sometimes in smokers. I don't know whether it's heavy smokers or what, and so they must be affecting their bacterial flora and their mouth. And, uh, and there, there's a bunch of other scenarios. And usually it's not serious, just, you know, a little bit of itchiness, lots of discharge, um, not very comfortable. Uh, and uh, the, the risk is, of course, that it could get into other body systems. Because sometimes people get systemic um, yeast infections, which is uh, which with this particular um, organism is a little bit more rare, but it does happen once in a while. Lower digestive tract. Okay, so now we're moving in. Um, there's only the one organism in the stomach we talked about way back, which is Helicobacter. Uh, but getting into the intestines, we're talking about hundreds of normal species are living there. Uh, here's a few. Uh, e. coli, of course, is the big one, but notice we also have Staphylococcus. It can get in there. It's not a problem. Uh, Enterococcus we did talk about before as well, which is uh, usually known as the type, uh, what is it, type B Streptococcus as well, as sometimes it's called or it used to be called there anyway. Um, so lots of potential pathogens as well. Uh, a lot of these things are not part or necessarily part of your normal flora. Uh, for example, entamoeba, right? That's the one that causes uh, amoebic dysentery, right? And uh, not part of your normal flora, but can get in there and cause uh, infections. And, and, and obviously, uh, not fun to have uh, not fun to have diarrhea. So let's talk about that gut for a minute. Um, it's very complex, and there's a lot of debate about what is normal 
Um, this is normal, but, and, and, and this is kind of the, the spread you see. And so you can see there's just talking with some different groupings of bacteria, the bacteroides and the firmicutes. The firmicutes are gram uh, uh, positives and the bacteroides are gram negatives. And uh, what I've done is just thrown in some of the common inhabitants, like so E. coli, uh, Pseudomonas over here, uh, Bacillus, Clostridium, uh, some, some names that you might recognize. Uh, but like I said, huge, huge variety here. And uh, they actually see quite a few differences if you start to look at things like people with diet. So you compare uh, uh, vegans or vegetarians to uh, meatitarians or you know, omnivores or whatever you want to call them. Um, or even um, just different cultural foods, right? Uh, you know, if you compare, you know, your typical, let's say, uh, uh, a person from India and their diet of, of you know, uh, certain types of spices and curry versus, uh, you know, someone who has a fast food diet. Uh, you, you know, you tend to see, um, you, you tend to see different differences there, right? And, uh, um, but yeah, this is kind of the, the profile. And E. coli, the most famous one of them all, is actually just a teeny tiny fraction of this whole thing. Uh, e. coli is, is just famous because it's super easy to grow and it's found in everybody, right? So it's, it's kind of one of those organisms that's uh, it's, uh, good for studying for that reason. So this is just another profile showing the gut composition as, you know, as people age. What were those green ones? The green ones are the uh, proteobacteria, so that includes the gram negatives like E. coli, and you can see they, they are huge. A wedge of this uh, as a baby, and that wedge gets a little bit smaller as people age. I don't really know the whole mechanism behind that. Part of his diet, part of his just aging of the body, and those kind of things. So here's the question, right? You know, what can we do about these microbes, and how are they affecting us? Are they messing with our mind? Are they messing with our body weight? Um, maybe. Uh, this was a famous study done a few years ago where. Um, what they did is they had those germ-free mice and they, um, they colonized the germ-free mice. So the one on the, on the right, they colonized the mice with the intestinal flora of a normal bodied human individual. And the one on the left, they took someone who um, was, uh, was quite obese, having weight issues, weight loss issues, and they took that person's intestinal flora and affected that mouse. And this mouse on the left, um, it, it had eating impulse problems and, and made itself obese. So, you know, what is going on here, right? Um, and the answer is we don't know. You know, it's kind of one of those chicken or which came first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing. Like, are you obese because of your bacteria or, or did you overeat and that encourage the bad bacteria to arrive? Uh, and there's a lot of people trying to investigate this and understand that. And anyone who's ever tried to lose weight knows that, you know, the answer is very simple, but it's very difficult, right? It's, it's all about calorie taking, intake, but how do you, you know, it's so, eating is a very complex thing, right? It's not just a physical reaction, it's emotional, it's, it's routine, you've got so many variables in there. And, uh, and, and, and so it's, it's, and this is just another one thrown in, in there that may have something to do with this. Um, there's other studies that show that uh, nutrient um, intake can actually be different based on your different bacteria. And I think this was related to this study here in that um, uh, the, uh, what is it, which one is it? The, uh, the firmicutes uh, tend to uh, help the human body absorb fats better. Um, and so if you have more firmicutes and you're eating a fatty diet, uh, you know, more of that's gonna get absorbed into your body and those kind of things. Uh, so, but like I said, very complex question here. And, and this was like 10 years ago now, Believe it or not, we still don't really have any anywhere near some answers. Um, but we'll talk about good bacteria here in a minute and, and how maybe we can encourage them. Um, but uh, I want to kind of finish just talking about the body systems. Where are we out of time? Time check. Okay. I think we're doing okay. Uh, so what about the uh, urinary and reproductive systems? So your, your bladder and urinary tract are usually considered to be sterile. And... Um, that's because, you know, things are usually a one-way passage, right? The urine goes out and mechanically that, you know, for the most part, kind of blasts out any organisms that are trying to get their way up there. And the exceptions, of course, are at the, at the, uh, the entrance way. Um, there, there will be bacteria there. And, uh, you know, and, and that is an entry route of where they can get up and cause urinary tract infections. Um, 
and, 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 and like I said, when there is infection, they're obviously less sterile. Uh, so the, the women's reproductive tract, on the other hand, uh, so the vagina is, um, is, is not uh, that system, right? It's not necessarily a one-way channel, and it, uh, it, is, uh, it is warm, it is moist, and actually has a whole host of different organisms in there. Uh, it's actually naturally acidic, and uh, the reason for that is actually these bacteria here, these lactobacillus. So there's an organism called lactobacillus acidophilus, which actually produces acid and makes the vagina uh, an acidic environment. And I'm not entirely sure, it probably has something to do with reproduction as to why it's acidic. I, I, I'd have to look that one up, but that's sort of the natural, um, uh, uh, the natural state. And so I think I'd mentioned before that uh, some women get a lot of yeast infections. And uh, so candida is the yeast, and uh, it's found in many body places as a natural part of our flora, found on our skin, found in the vagina, found in the mouth, those kind of things. Um, but when it gets a chance to grow, uh, then it can cause the yeast infection. So some women get yeast infections kind of on a cyclic nature with their periods, because as their body and pH changes, it allows the, um, allows the yeast to kind of get a foothold. Um, some women get yeast infections when they take antibiotics. So it wipes out their normal bacterial complement, and then now the yeast has a chance to kind of thrive and grow. And uh, so I don't know exactly how common yeast infections are, but my understanding is most women will get at least one or, or, or many in their lifetime. And uh, it's just an overgrowth of, um, uh, of candida. And uh, so, you know, and, and we'll talk about, um, I'm hoping to get to probiotics and talk about what might, might be done about this. Thing. So potential pathogens, we're talking about, uh, you know, the normal inhabitants, plus also a whole variety of uh, urinary tract infections and sexually transmitted infections. And we're gonna kind of talk about some of these uh, in topic 14 and, and go into a little bit of detail on these. A lot of these kind of have similar things going on, right? Uh, you're looking at, uh, you know, discomfort, um, uh, discomfort during intercourse, uh, sometimes discharges. Some of these things can get up into the systems and cause, uh, you know, issues with, uh, if it's a urinary tract infection, they can cause issues with the bladder or serious kidney conditions. Uh, if they're sexually transmitted infections, they can get uh, they can get deeper into the reproductive system and cause, in some cases, infertility. Right, if they're affecting the uh, the ovums or the, or the or the testes in both men and women. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, the uh, the microbiome. There's a lot of good things, a lot of good organisms there, and a lot of them can protect us. And how do they do that? Um, I kind of think I probably should have put this slide earlier, but whatever. Things are out of order. Uh, so how do they protect us? One is they occupy the niche. The niche means the environment. So I just gave you the example. If you have that lactobacillus, it is cause it is uh, creating an ideal environment uh, in in the, in the vagina and, uh, and and not allowing yeast to grow and thrive. And so that's a good thing. And many organisms fulfill this role. What else can they do? They can produce acids. So some organisms, uh, again, that's a good example of lactobacillus, but there are organisms on our skin and our gut that produce chemicals such as acids that also inhibit the growth of, of uh, unrelated organisms. Some of them produce um, proteins called bacteriosins. So bacteriosin, I don't know if I have it defined in the notes. It's basically a, pro it's a protein produced by one bacteria and it inhibits growth of another bacteria. Sometimes even closely related. Uh, and uh, so they have mechanisms for, and this is just kind of your normal kind of biology, ecology kind of thing, where one organism is, is living here and it sort of prevents the growth of another organism there. So this is what we want to do for human health, is we want to encourage the good ones and hopefully discourage the bad ones. And uh, this is kind of a good segue into this whole new era of probiotics. So it's kind of funny, uh, just in terms of the age I am watching probiotics kind of take over. I remember when I was a student and hearing a talk about the concept of probiotics and the researcher was talking about when he first got into it, it was so hard to convince anybody to give them money to research this thing. Because the whole idea 40 years ago was really, okay, bacteria bad, let's kill them, right? Even though we knew better, all the research was showing this stuff about, you know, but it just wasn't sort of the main idea out there. And, and eventually probiotics kind of came out as this idea of, you know, maybe we can somehow apply to our bodies the good microorganisms 
and they're going to do good things for us. So most probiotics, by the way, are yogurts. Like literally 90, probably 8% of these probiotics are some sort of yogurt. Uh, there's a whole bunch here. You can see these are, these are ones I saw in the grocery store. And, and these ones in particular, I was looking at, um, uh, you can see they have, uh, like this one has immunity written on it, right? Uh, Activia probiotic yogurt, they're probably the most famous one. Uh, in terms of the marketing, Activia, it, it, like the marketing they have is huge. You go to their website, they, they uh, cite all sorts of uh, research papers. And uh, I think they actually got sued at one point for saying a little more than they should have. Um, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute in terms of the claims about probiotics. But there's all sorts of other products out here. I, I was just doing a Google search, found some sort of, uh, I don't know if that's a granola bar or what it is. Um, I saw this in the uh, airport. I was going to the airport, I want to buy a package of gum. And there it was. I was like, hey, there's some probiotics. And uh, I looked this one up on their website. And this is apparently to uh, help people um, treat traveler's diarrhea. So like traveler's diarrhea is usually uh, E. coli. And so you're trying to colonize your gut with the good bacteria. Each caplet apparently has billions of uh, bacteria in one tablet. Uh, and everywhere I look, I see these products now. Probiotic coffee, I don't know how that works. Like you think as you're, as you're cooking it, you're, you're killing the microbes. They're making claims that, you know, the coffee beans are, are laced with, with good bacteria. Um, I got this in my mailbox. This is from Popeye's, the supplement place. And I noticed this big advertisement for this, uh, this giant probiotic. Um, I don't know what you do with it. Put it in your smoothie. And I mean, it, it just, it, it's no end to these things. Um, baby puppies. So giving them to babies, right? And, uh, I, you know, like I said, going through the grocery store and I'm just like, holy cow, this is, I mean, this is just recently, I mean, I feel like, like they were exploded five years ago and now lately, I mean, I'm surprised there's not a whole aisle for these things. Um, here's another one here. Uh, and, and actually what's cut off from this is there was a vegan version because I imagine, like I said, a lot of these things are yogurt based products. Um, the other thing I noticed is look at the price of these things, right? People are willing to pay big bucks for probiotics. So but let's just talk a little bit about, about what these things are. Um, there are a variety of probiotics. Usually it's one of these three species, um, lactobacillus or uh, bifidobacterium. And you can see uh, um, we're looking at often, like I said, yogurt and dairy type of products. And uh, we're often talking about supporting, um, uh, supporting digestive type of functions. Okay, so what I have, um, this is just sort of a start. I just wanted to show you the bacteria. What I actually made for you is kind of a, a claims chart, right? And it's actually really hard to find all this information in one place. So I had to make my own chart in terms of what are the claims of these probiotics? So you can see I put um, the big capital yes means yes, we have good evidence. The small yes means some evidence. And then we have some maybes and question marks. So you can see this kind of this main category of intestinal um, treating intestinal symptoms uh, is where we have the most amount of data that probiotics are actually helping. And that makes sense. You're eating something, right? And so we want to put good stuff into our um, intestinal tract. So things like traveler's diarrhea, we can see some people are looking at, you know, maybe looking at uh, digestive disorders such as Crohn's disease and whatnot. And, um, but the yes isn't like yes for everybody. This turns out probiotic studies are really, really complex. If you look at like, if I were to feed everybody here the same food, we're all going to react differently. All of us, have, you know, we're complex organisms. So you look at these studies and you have, okay, 40% of the people that helped. Um, but, and, and then of those 40%, some people helped a huge amount, some people just a little bit and so on. But there's all sorts of other claims around the immune system. And, uh, and I, these ones here, reducing your cholesterol, what are we talking about here? Like this is just this is just garbage stuff. Uh, some of these things they make claims that they shouldn't be. Um, what about reducing yeast infections? Um, yes, actually, it turns out that um, some women who have reoccurring yeast infections can benefit from from probiotics. Not all, some. Um, I think it was something like 25, 30 um, percent. So it's it's you know there is some research there. So almost done. I just want to finish off with um, talking about one more. Um, I'm not going to call this probiotic, but how we can uh, reintroduce a healthy microbiome. And this is something called a fecal transplant. And this is something that is being used 
now for C. diff infections. So this is the kind of thing that 10 years ago, there were like maybe two clinics in all of Canada that we even, even consider doing this. Um, now there are dozens out there um, because C. diff is really hard to treat. I was just telling you about my friend who was on uh, the clindamycin and got the C. diff infection. He went from antibiotic to antibiotic for like two months before he got rid of the C. diff infection. Um, and so what can we do about C. diff? Well, we can give people a normal microbial flora. So it turns out this has been around since the 1950s, but there's a lot of research now that shows that this is very effective, like 95% effective. So how does it work? Pretty simple, you get a, a donor, <laughs> um, usually someone that they live with, right? Uh, I don't know exactly what the process is for sanitizing, and I think it gets uh, basically solidized and put into saline. Sometimes they test it, they wanna make sure the person is not sick, because there is some risk here. There is some risk, and there are cases where people are actually giving someone some sort of disease, right? And then it can be taken, you know, we have, we have two entrances, right? The top and the bottom. Um, so pills or enema. And then, and then there you go. So for C. diff, 95% success rate. How many things are 95%? Like, this is amazing. Um, took a long time to get going because who wants to research this in terms of, like, this is not a pharmaceutical company thing. They're not going to make any money harvesting poo from your relatives, right? Um, so there was, there was little interest to study it. But that 95% success rate thing was kind of the big, um, the big area where people were like, hey, we should look into this. And since then, last slide, I promise. Since then, there's been all sorts of other studies looking at, hey, can we use this to, um, you know, is this going to help us with other conditions? And there's a bunch of, um, there's certain types of conditions where people are taking drugs, and some people absorb the drugs really well, and some people don't. And it turns out with certain cancer treatments, this may actually be the answer. People on chemotherapy, you know, it's killing their normal flora, their normal flora is totally messed with, so what can you do? Well, you can give the person a fecal transplant, and they can absorb the drugs better. Um, there's been a few studies now that it, um, a lot of people with autism have uh, a severe digestive discomfort, uh, and helping them with that as well. Um, like I said, this is kind of something relatively new, but uh, but there's a lot of promise in certain areas. All right, so I am done for today. Um, please remember to return your midterms, and I will see you after the reading break. Okay, so I'll see you next Tuesday.